Good afternoon. I'm Paul Sieving, the uh, director of the National Eye Institute, and it's my pleasure today to welcome Fred Gage to uh, this afternoon lecture at NIH. Actually, Fred is better known as Rusty. Rusty uh, is head of the uh, Laboratory of Genetics at the Salk Institute. He received a PhD from Johns Hopkins in uh, 1976 and then traveled, I think the route was Texas, Sweden, and San Diego. That's quite a tour. And then in 1995 joined the uh, Salk Institute. He currently holds the Adler Chair for research on age-related neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, Rusty, uh, his work centers around the adult uh, CNS, central nervous system, and the unexpected plasticity that the CNS exhibits throughout the life of many or perhaps all mammals. His studies focus uh, using cellular and molecular techniques uh, on environmental influences in one way or another that uh, help to regulate neurogenesis in the adult. Of course, the National Eye Institute is very pleased, Rusty, that occasionally you have uh, found your way to the retina, the neural retina, and uh, seen that that also is a very good system in which to explore uh, these ideas. He has uh, won numerous prizes and awards for his work. A very, very brief uh, list of those is the KO Medical Science Prize, the Charles Dana Award, Metropolitan Life Research Award, and uh, recently the Ipsen Prize for Neuroplasticity. He is also a triple threat uh, in that uh, he holds membership, was elected to membership in the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the American Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, another uh, gauge of the range of his work is that he has previously been president of the Society for Neuroscience and is president-elect of the International Society for Stem Cell Research. Uh, perhaps for us today, a final measure of uh, his work on plasticity is that he is demonstrating that uh, even today and given the Walls Lecture, the Wednesday afternoon lecture on Thursday. So if you would join me please in welcoming uh, Rusty to speak today on neuronal plasticity and diversity in the adult mammalian brain. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back. I haven't been back to NIH in a while, and uh, while I was uh, thinking about the type of lecture that I would give here, um, I decided that I'd give a uh, dual talk, one just a brief update on the work that we have been spending much of our time in the last uh, 15 years doing on adult uh, neurogenesis and adult plasticity, just to refresh you all. and what I'm interested in, uh, in, that, in that realm, where we're going. But then I'm going to uh, diverge a bit and uh, talk about something that uh, we're spending more and more time on in my laboratory. And it, uh, it spun out of work that initially was started as a function of our work in adult neuro neurogenesis. And I think for students and uh, postdocs in the lab, maybe junior investigators, maybe even senior investigators, it's a it's an interesting lesson where you're um, working on one project, uh, going deep into it, trying to understand more about it, and then you have some serendipitous finding in your lab, and you, um, it looks interesting, and you, you think to yourself, well, uh, should I follow this up? That's kind of risky, or should I stick with what I'm, what I'm doing uh, where it's safe, and I know I can get some success? And, uh, so we started uh, this second part of my talk about eight years ago, and I'll, I'll tell you about this transition point and, and where we are on this journey of trying to find out something about something we didn't know very much or I didn't know very much about at all. But the first part of this talk um, deals with, a, and I, I must say that, that where I am in this other area is reminiscent of how I started in this area of adult neurogenesis, where early on, the question was whether or not there really are cells dividing in the adult nervous system, as this had not been uh, accepted well as an uh, underlying principle within adult uh, neurobiology. 
And the reasons for this uh, lack of acceptance, I think, is because uh, many of you not being neurobiologists do accept the realization the brain is very complicated. We as neurobiologists like to say it's more complicated than any other organ. But uh, at least uh, you know that this, the principal cells in the central nervous system are these neuronal structures with uh, large cells with many processes and uh, these sort of outrageous numbers that we give to them with humans having something on the order of 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections between them. And the question was how could, and also the brain being the structure which is involved in our sensory awareness, our ability to think and communicate with each other. So the idea that there were cells or neurons in the brain that could divide and give rise to new neurons was met, I think, rightly with significant amount of, of concern and skepticism that a cell this complex could divide and give rise to another cell with uh, connections. And that the truth is that that doesn't happen in the adult nervous system. But rather, there are uh, stem cells that persist in the adult nervous system throughout life. And, they're, and so that's, that's one of the issues. So neurons don't divide. And the other area is that they don't divide everywhere. So cells are not just dividing everywhere in the adult brain, but rather they're restricted to two, two areas of the brain. One area is this structure called the subventricular zone. And the, li the lining of the, the subventricular zone uh, is made up of a niche with some ciliated cells and a, a stem cell, a progenitor cell, and some glial cells that uh, persist throughout life in this subventricular structure. Periodically, the neural progenitor cell will migrate over a very long distance, in fact, out to the olfactory bulb, where they turn perpendicularly and differentiate into granule cells, and some of them do, and the rest of them bypass through this, these large mitral and tufted cells into the glomerulus where they differentiate into neurons. This process continues throughout life, and in mice they've done, some colleagues in, in Japan have done an interesting study doing lineage tracing showing that this structure turns over 1.5 times in the lifetime of an adult mouse. So there's a significant amount of turnover. The other area where this occurs and where I've spent most of my effort is in a structure called the hippocampus. And this is an area of the brain that's involved in learning and memory, and in particular in the acquisition of new memories and the recollection of objects that are uh, closely related to each other. So it's, a, its function is involved in what we call pattern separation. The hippocampus takes in information from lots of sensory modalities and then brings them into the hippocampus and stores it into a single memory where it's stored in the, in the cortex. And these newly born cells only occur in the structure called the dentate, where they sit at the basal area here and they proliferate in clusters and give rise to newborn neurons, some of which die, others uh, integrate into the circuitry. We know now that uh, in all structures, in all mammals to date, uh, have shown neurogenesis at least in the, in the hippocampus. There still remains some question in the uh, subventricular zone of the olfactory bulb whether or not neurogenesis occurs, but in the hippocampus it does occur. This is uh, a variety of ways in which one can monitor this. Early on, we uh, used bromodeoxyuridine, uh, which had been used in cancer studies to label proliferating cancers. Uh, but that it does go to the central nervous system well and it incorporates and intercalates into the DNA of dividing cells. This allows them as a fate marker to see uh, which cells survive and where they are. So here's an adult uh, rat uh, two months after injections of BRDU and each of these blue black dots uh, shows a newly born cell that was born in the adult uh, animal and survived for at least two months. More recent, this is a good way to quantitate how many new cells are coming into the system. But we um, have more recently developed the use of a malonium murine retrovirus as a way to tag the cells genetically. Uh, since the malonium murine only integrates into uh, cells that are undergoing cell division because it doesn't have an import machinery to it, you can use this to catch dividing cells and then label them. And this way now you get to observe 
the dendrites and the spines, and you can use this vector as well to knock down genes or overexpress genes. So it's a, a useful tool for following uh, activity. This is sort of what it looks like um, in the adult brain. Uh, three days after an injection of the Maloney virus, the cells are immature, sort of flat, uh, polarized in, in, a, in a horizontal manner. By seven days, they start orienting. By 14 days, they have uh, polarized into this area called the molecular area, and they've also already sent their axon out to the target area, which is the CA3. And then uh, by 21 days, they have spines, and they're starting to make morphological connections with each other. And by day 28, they are electrophysiologically active. You can patch clamp these cells and show that they're spontaneously active. So neurogenesis, this process of neurogenesis, is not just sort of a neuron is born, but rather it goes through quite a range of, of changes, and it doesn't really fully mature for another month. So it takes about eight weeks for these cells. The current, our current thinking of this is this period between 21 days and probably 48 days is when the cells are uh, most active or uniquely active, and they're, they're hyper-excitable at this stage. We believe that's an important feature in, in why they've persisted throughout uh, life in all these mammalian cells. This is a picture of a, sometimes you think about the fact why and how could this small number of new cells being generated in this structure have some meaningful impact on behavior? Well, here's the hippocampus, and each one of these green, cell, green cells corresponds to a cell that was born in the dentate uh, of an adult animal within about a three and a half hour period of time because it's a single injection of a virus that's seven t five times 10 to the seventh, um, and it degrades quite rapidly. So these cells were born two months ago, and this is one section through the entire uh, hippocampus representing those new cells. And here they've survived at least two months. They have their nice dendrites that receiving input from the neuronal cortex, and all of this corresponds to the axons that come from these cells. So when looking at BRDU, you see this, the survival of the cell, but here you get a better image of how they can have an impact on the whole structure itself. Now, this process of neurogenesis is not, um, is not sort of stable throughout life, but rather uh, is highly regulated by a variety of, of uh, events, including physical activity, uh, variety of diseases can increase aberrantly neurogenesis, and then almost every mouse and human model so far looked at, there's some decrease in neurogenesis, I think, in, in, the, in human animals. But the problem is that we don't know yet whether or not this decrease in neurogenesis in some of these animal models, for example, is caused by the mutations or whether or not it's caused by some change in the behavior of the animal that consequently results in a, uh, a decrease. One of the most robust phenomena that uh, one has seen in this uh, area was uh, something that uh, Henriette Van Prague uh, discovered in our lab many years ago, and that is that if you take uh, a normal, healthy mouse and put them on a treadmill, actually we put them in running wheels, this is manufactured, um, and, and uh, we've used uh, our Mac to uh, Photoshop this. This is not a real towel either. We don't actually make that. <laughs> but there's a linear correlation between the number of uh, the distance run and the number of new cells. And this holds up, it turns out, in, um, in a variety of species. And also, uh, more recently, uh, a lot of work's being done in humans showing that there's changes in hippocampal volume with physical exercise. So there's a whole area of research that continues on this vein, but now I'm going to start taking you off in this other tangent. Um, and it, it began as we developed procedures to isolate these cells from the adult nervous system to study their properties in vitro. And our objective here was to learn more about the cell and molecular biology of how these cells behave. We developed techniques where we could isolate cells with percolate gradient from really anywhere in the adult brain. Uh, pull down a population, seed them into culture with FGF2 in a serum-free condition. When we do that, uh, they grow indefinitely, basically, as stem cells. And this is where we determined that they were in stem cells by virtue of their ability to self-renew and give rise to all the neural lineages. But these cells are also clonable. So we can take individual clones and put them in a dish, and they'll grow up as clones. 
And we use the Maloney murine retrovirus in this case at low titer in the mixed dish to pull out clones that are different color. And then we can do single cell, expand the clone up and do a southern blot and show that the expanded clone is all derived from a cell that had a single integration site. So this is our uh, way of clonally, uh, our molecular cloning of, this, of these cells. And we can do this indefinitely with multiple clones, confirming that they uh, do have stem cell properties. And we've also established conditions where we can take individual cells and culture, <coughs> and uh, they'll divide, or they'll, they'll survive. And in this case, it, it's with FGF2 and a protein that we had isolated from the conditioned media that when we give it in, uh, back to the cells, it maintains them at this low density, and they'll persist as uh, these cells for long periods of time, and they'll divide, and you can say they're dividing symmetrically and retaining their stem cell properties, so they are self-renewing. And down here, I don't know if you can see up the hours, this is the number of hours that it takes, and these cells will divide indefinitely uh, until they reach a point where they are confluent, they come in contact with each other, and they begin to differentiate. Well, we wanted to know what were the molecules that were important uh, that, dif that define these cells in these different states. We developed conditions where we could take the stem cell, which we could define by a variety of factors, and maintain them as stem cells with these factors, and then we swap them to other conditions. We can make a fairly purified population of neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. And with the CCG, we can keep them in a, uh, a very special condition. So by virtue of being able to differentiate the cells into all these different lineages, as well as maintain them as stem cells, um, we developed a, uh, we developed some of the, set up some of the early uh, microarray. In, in, in these early days, you used glass microarrays, as some of you may remember, and you had to make your own. And in those days, uh, the arrays were made up of complete uh, genomic material, so we didn't mask for repeat areas. So this is pretty much... Uh, everything that we were scanning for that might be expressed within these cells in their different lineages. A very special lineage that we were looking after was one that was FGF2 CCG. That these cells uh, were committed to become neurons, but they were still dividing. So this purified, low-density neurogenic population that we were particularly interested in. So we did the arrays for this population and subtracted the genes that were expressed versus uh, neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, as well as the sort of authentic heterogeneous stem cell population. And the genes that came up in the first nine uh, genes that were expressed, top arrays in the array, were these sequences here. So they were all line, parts of line elements, ORF2 with the uh, endonuclease component. And V was actually quite disappointed in this because here she was uh, looking for canonical Wnt signals or notch signaling or BMPs that might be of significance. And what she got was what had previously been considered uh, junk by some, and, uh, but mobile elements nevertheless. So what are line elements? Well, when we have to give credit, among others, to uh, our thinking about these uh, genomic DNA to uh, Barbara McClintock, who in the late 40s identified the fact that there were transposons who were mobile within the DNA of maize. And a significant amount of uh, recognition for this was given over the years, but uh, there was also some resistance to this, uh, the importance that this might play. And in reading back through some of her writing, it was clear that in addition to just the demonstration technically of the mobility of these genes in the genome, she hypothesized that these mobile elements may play some role in development, may play some role in gene regulation. And it was this that was met with more resistance than the fact that they were jumping. And I think this part is sometimes misunderstood. Nevertheless, uh, Leslie Orgel and Francis Crick described a lot of this high genomic uh, material as junk DNA and Richard Dawkins' discussion of the selfish gene 
cast a light on this, uh, these mobile elements as being uh, less interesting, perhaps, than they might be to others. But when you look at the sequence of the human genome and uh, look at the total amount of DNA that's attributable to these uh, elements, the non-coding, the non-LTR line elements account for 17% of the entire DNA within the human genome. And remember, 2% is coding sequence. And really, many of these other sequences, like ALUs, pseudogenes, uh, DNA transposon, HERVs, account for totally over 50% of the total genome is made up of elements, these repeat elements, that are in one way or another attributable to these mobile elements within the genome. And the evolution of this and how it came that way is a fascinating area of investigation that is not fully understood currently. And the ones that we're particularly interested in are these line elements. These are long interspersed nucleotide elements. Uh, it's estimated, depends on how you look at the sequences in the genome, it's being revised all the time, that there are at least 150 active elements, that means full length elements, and in humans, and over 3,000 in mice. Uh, so what is the mechanism, just to put this in, in, in very general terms, what the what the thinking is about how they function. They're about 6.2 KB, the full length active elements. They have a, a five prime promoter, untranslated promoter, an ORF1, which is uh, a, a RNA binding protein, among other things, that uh, is, the, is ORF1. ORF2 contains an endonuclease and a reverse transcriptase. And interestingly, this transcribes the RNA and the translated proteins then bind back onto uh, the RNA, and ORF1 acting as a RNA binding protein also recruits in or the endonuclease and reverse transcriptase. When the cell is undergoing cell division, this complex, this ribonuclear complex, can be transported into the nucleus through yet not well understood mechanisms where the endonuclease can nick the DNA and then the reverse transcriptase can turn the RNA back into DNA and this can insert uh, within the, the genome. Now, I'm going to repeat the fact that this process is as much as it, it's, it's mostly thought of to occur when the cell is undergoing cell division. There's some ev evidence that it can happen in a, in a non-dividing cell, but most of the evidence supports the fact that it requires a dividing cell for this to occur. Now, that's just, just a, an, another piece of this, is this machinery can also be used on lines, uh, it's ALUs uh, in regular mRNA and sign elements can use this machinery to hij be hijacked so that they can be inserted in the central nervous system as well. So the line elements is just one of the uh, elements that have this capacity for reinsertion. So we took advantage of a, uh, a method or a technique or a marker sequence developed by John Morin and uh, in Haig Kazazian's lab and this is to make, take a human artificial line one and put a GFP with an intron flanked by a donor acceptor, acceptor sites into the three prime end. Now the advantage of this is that when the RNA is transcribed, the intron is uh, deleted, the RNA fuses, when the complex is made and inserted, uh, you get R, R, uh, GFP off of the DNA sequence, which is inserted back in the genome. So this can be used as a marker, not, not only for whether or not this is trans, uh, expressed, but whether or not it's inserted within the genome. So using this uh, marker, we uh, tested our neural progenitor cells in culture. And we actually compared this to fibroblast, mesenchymal stem cells, and other types of stem cells. And the only ones in which we saw uh, GFP uh, expressing cells were in the neural progenitor cells. And only when we infected them at, a, at the sort of last stage of their cell division, when they were highly proliferative in the non-CCG -C -C, uh, state or in a more mixed C, uh, stem cell state, we saw very little. And we can prove that this uh, has inserted by showing that the smaller piece, the deleted piece, uh, exists in the genome of these uh, NPCs at this state. Now, in vitro, we did a lot of experiments with the in vitro, and we wanted to make sure 
that the uh, insertions were, oh, this is a, a phenomenon that was worth happening. And I should say that we confirmed the, the microarray experiments with PCR, QBCR, showing that it was actually, these cells did make a lot of, of uh, the line sequences that we saw. In fact, quite surprisingly, at this two-day, three-day stage after the cells are uh, beginning to differentiate into neuron, it's one of the most abundant uh, RNA transcripts are these line transcripts. But whether or not this occurs is a tissue culture artifact or real, we made a transgenic animal with basically the same construct with some flanking area there so that it would be expressed. And one of the most great fun for us to, when we took the adult brain tissue and examined it and we saw green cells uh, throughout the central nervous system and the striatum and cerebellum had beautiful morphology of the cells, uh, new in, in, in many areas, uh, but they were not uh, expressed in astrocytes, in our hands, or in microglia, uh, uh, but only rather, or oligodendrocytes for that matter, but really only in neurons. And we could do laser capture, single cell laser capture, and confirm that these green cells had insertions as a, uh, appropriately, whereas negative cells, if you just sort of take it out there, you, you wouldn't see uh, see this, so suggesting that these really were authentic insertions that are occurring in vivo. So where do they go? And, and uh, this, is, this is early work uh, trying to address the question, uh, two of the main questions in all of this is that, you know, does this really occur, where does it occur, and what impact might it have? And this was some of the early efforts uh, in vitro to do that using these reporter constructs. So one of the things that we could do with these clones uh, was to grow up clones uh, individually and then use inverse PCR using sequences within the line element, uh, sequencing out from the line element, and then we could identify what gene, blast those uh, sequences back to the genome and identify where the line had inserted within the genome of that clone of cells. We've done this for about 50 individual clones, and a lot of the genes are neuronal uh, or have neuronal function, reported neuronal function, some housekeeping, and um, certainly other genes as well. This could be sort of artifactual because we are growing the cells uh, as neural progenitor cells, so it's likely that neural-related genes are open, their chromatin is more open at that stage. Maybe that's a reason why the insertions occur in those areas. <clears throat> so that's a, a caveat in the description or discussion of that. Can line insertion change gene expression? So one of the ways that we've done this with several of these genes is to identify where they've inserted and then determine whether or not there's any phenotype. And here's one example using PSD93 as an insertion site. So we mapped that the, the, the line element jumped into the promoted 5 prime into the PSD93. And we chose, I choose, chose this one to talk about because this clone, CL22, shows an overexpression of PSD93 under normal stem cell conditions, where it's in the wild type, it's, uh, it's not there, both in terms of the RNA and in terms of uh, protein. And also because this clone, when we differentiate these cells with retinoic acid foreskin, which is our sort of general way of differentiating the cells when we pull FGF away, normally, the wild type population gives about 60% neurons, glia, and undifferentiated or un unidentified cells. But this clone, with the same conditions, differentiated mostly into neurons. So to sort of examine that a little bit, we cloned the rat version, these are rat cells, and overexpressed PSD93 into these cells and could evidence the fact that they showed a greater propensity for giving rise to neurons. And then when we knocked down PSD93 in this CL22 clone, we rescued some elements of the, uh, of the phenotype, in other words, less neurons. So suggesting the fact that one insertion or this particular insertion by virtue of this clone was having some effect on the fate of the cells. Certainly not controlling all of it, but might have some control. This is a, a small reduced slide, so it's hard to read, but it, the, the point here is that what are the consequences of insertions? Well, the consequences can be multiple. They could 
uh, insert in the middle of a coding sequence, obviously interrupting the function of a gene. They could insert into non-coding sequences, which would result perhaps in uh, changing uh, splice variation. They can add a poly A tail so they can elongate the uh, size of a gene. One of the really interesting features of this, uh, the line element, is that it has internal promoters that express in both directions. So this affords the opportunity for uh, some very interesting mischief on the part of these line elements with just their non-coding sequences, uh, independent of whether or not they insert. And then, as I'll tell you a bit later, they might have some impact on uh, epigenetic phenomena through their impacts on uh, methylation. So everything I've talked about so far uh, has been using this reporter construct as a method of uh, looking at it. And of course, that uh, has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages, is that it's a single reporter. In the mice that we've been looking at, there are 3,000 elements. So we're just looking at the tip of the uh, experiment here. So we've wanted to develop methods to take a look at the, in, at the endogenous uh, line elements. And the first way that we chose to do that uh, was developed by uh, Nicole Kofel and uh, Carol Marchetto in the lab. And this is a more recent elaboration uh, on that method by Mike McConnell, where <clears throat> he takes uh, individual cells and uses an antibody to new in and sorts the cells in facts for individual cells, plates the cells in a 96-well plate, and does the same thing for tissues from heart, liver, and uh, other tissues. Now here's the, the, the theory is that if in fact there are line elements, and there's 3,000 of them active, if they are jumping into the DNA, or into the genome, then you may be able to pick up a copy number variance. You may be able to pick up a change in the total amount of DNA if you use primers for the line elements specifically and compare that with sequences that may be of high abundance but are not mobile in the DNA. So in this case, he did single cell 96 well plate using TACMAN qPCR and in the same wells mixing primers for ORF2 and the 5S uh, as well as satellite and other stretches of uh, DNA that are not mobile finds his threshold uh, for both, and then calculates uh, a DCT between the two, with a lower number being the uh, higher amount of DNA copy. That is a lower number of cycles required to reach threshold. Doing this, uh, what Mike finds is that um, plotting 80 to 80 cells, so these are each 80 to 80 cells plotted, an accumulative probability graph, the liver and the intestines, the heart, kidney all map around each other, and the heart and the hippocampus and the other neural tissues that he's done always uh, show a greater amount of DNA content within the genome of these individual cells. And obviously there's variability from those that are not different to those that are actually quite different. And this is also sort of pilot new, new data that he's generating using this new method uh, here, plotting 432 neuro individual neurons from the cortex of the frontal cortex of one mouse and comparing that to the cortex of a second genetically identical age matched, sex matched, so uh, monozygotic twin of that mouse. And these two mice have different numbers or different amounts of DNA in their individual cells. So not only are there differences between uh, brain and other organs in terms of increases, but individual cells uh, between animals are different from each other. So the other feature of this is that uh, when looking at, and this is an older, gra older uh, plot, and it needs to be updated, but it, it holds still, that uh, as, and this, this is always not correct to sort of plot it in this way in some sort of linear increase, but this is size in any event uh, the number of uh, the percent of the uh, non-coding uh, mobile elements that exist in the genome, and the human has actually more than other species. So it's not going away, uh, but rather increasing for some reason. And this is an older paper by uh, Haig, Kazazian, and 
also John Moran was uh, uh, in this study, where they were trying to estimate how many active elements existed in the human. And, and the way they did was, was to map for human uh, full-length lines, clone them out, and then put them into a cell line, a transformed cell line that would act actively allow for insertions to take place. And they sort of characterized here uh, which ones of the elements were active and which ones were less active, and proposed that there were a, a smaller number, while all of them were active, a smaller number of them were highly active. Of course, it's difficult when we redo or rethink about this, remembering that these are now put in the context of another cell, so we, we would have to sort of revise our thinking about that. But nevertheless, it gives an idea. So we wanted to uh, see whether or not w there was line element mobility in human cells. And uh, since um, the line mobility is occurring primarily in, at this early stage, we wanted to watch that part of it as well. So one way to do that is to use human embryonic stem cells. <clears throat> so we have developed procedures where we can take human ES cells, make EBs, rosettes, and then differentiate the cells into a neural progenitor pool. That neural progenitor pool is in our hands uh, a reproducible group of cells that we can propagate, freeze down, thaw, and do experiments with. So we can then transfect these cells and uh, differentiate them now in, in our differentiating conditions. And what we found was it, using a reporter construct of, with a line promoter driving luciferase, there was a dramatic increase in activity at, at two days at the time when the cells are just becoming neurons. And in, in looking at the number of green cells that uh, were there, we, we definitely saw uh, a significant number of cells that showed an increase in uh, GFP positivity, suggesting that there was insertions. When we fully differentiated the cells, we wanted to see whether or not maybe this insertion was, was lethal and that they, the ones that, that did have insertions died. But we found plenty of green cells that were neurons, that we could patch clamp them, they had electrophysiological properties. So the insertion by itself uh, was not lethal, but it did occur. Now, if it does occur in this in vitro setting, could it occur in in vivo setting? And given the fact that Mike and Nicole and Carol had developed this technique for mouse single cell, we tried to do single cell PCR for human uh, autopsy material, and we haven't been able to get that done yet. But we can take chunks of postmortem tissue, and from the same patients or same autopsies, we get uh, a variety of brain tissues, and we can get heart and liver from those same patients. So we make genomic DNA and then do a very similar qPCR, TACMAN multiplexing reaction, now loading with about 80 picograms of starting material for the reaction to take place. Now the theory is that if there are more, <coughs> there's more, if there's jumping, of or insertion of line elements into the genome of the human brain, we should see a greater amount of DNA content uh, relative to other tissues. And uh, I probably wouldn't be telling you this if it weren't true, and we have seen in all cases, so here's an N of six, where the effect is so big that we can just mean, we can take a mean of these. We don't have to do a paired comparison because the human brain tissues always showed a greater amount of DNA content than did the liver, the heart, or, or other tissues. And when we use the, compared to two, two different um, uh, non-jumping, non-mobile elements as controls, we see no difference between them. So uh, it looks like this is actually uh, quite reasonable. But as you saw, we saw some difference here between the cerebellum and the hippocampus. So we, we took this further and started doing micro dissections of human brain tissue uh, to see whether or not there was any pattern that emerged that would tell us. And I was anticipating that maybe the, the mobile area, the, mobile, the areas that of greatest uh, mobility might be associated with these proliferative zones. And that didn't quite hold up, although um, we're not finished with this analysis. But just have it said that there are significant differences between areas of the brain from each other that we're trying to understand. And the variances 
is small enough so it's, it looks like it's believable. If it were just completely random and they were jumping everywhere, I don't think we would see these differences. Uh, but in all cases, they're different from heart and liver. Uh, once again, confirming this idea that there's more DNA content in, in brain than the other, other ones. So one of the things we wanted to do was to try to guess at how many, how many insertions would occur in the human. If you have a total of, <clears throat> say, 150 active elements and maybe a smaller number of that being uh, active at any one time, how many successful insertions would you see? Um, and obviously there's lots of RNA that's being made, so the potential for any one line element to insert is pretty high. So we did this experiment this way, and it requires a little bit of a calculation and explanation for the back of the envelope method for how we calculated this. So we went back to our hippocampus and liver where we got a, a nice difference between the two there using this ratio method. And we uh, spiked back into the liver copies of line sequence, so line plasmids. So 10, 100, 1,000, or 10,000, and then ran the reaction with liver to see how many extra plasmids it would take to come up to, this, to the DNA content size of the wild-type hippocampus. And someplace between 10,000, or 1,000 and 10,000 uh, plasmids per 80,000 or 12 cells. So if you figure that um, our starting sample was 80 picograms per, of DNA, and each genome is about 6.6 .6 picograms of DNA, that's 12 cells approximately, divided by these numbers, gives you a back of the envelope calculation of there being somewhere between 80 and 300 uh, insertions of line sequence in every cell uh, on average that survive into adult or into these pa this group of patients. So how is it regulated? Um, this is just a summary of a study that was published recently where we've looked at the line sequence and have found that there's a variety of interesting DNA binding domains. Most interesting from our perspective is that there's a SOX2 binding domain which uh, plays a role, as it turns out, in suppressing line activity. So SOX2 acts as a suppressor in a suppressor complex that includes HDACs and other molecules. When the cells begin to differentiate into neurons, SOX2 comes off and the cells are activated by WNT3A through the uh, beta-catenin to TCF to bind to the DNA of this uh, line element, and that induces uh, activity in, of the lines during this period of time where the cells are undergoing differentiation. So mechanistically, it looks as though this machinery is quite important for the activation of the line in neural progenitor cells. Interestingly, these are the same factors that are used by genes such as NeuroD1, which is a neural progenitor factor, a neural differentiation factor, and they use the same machinery. So there's a redundancy of, of transcriptional machinery being used to, to activate the line as it is to activate neurons. In addition to the SOX2 binding site, when we looked around the SOX2 site, we find that they're surrounded by islands of CPG, or methylation sites. We look at that a little bit more carefully. Uh, just to remind you that CPG uh, islands or CPG binding sites are sites for methyl binding proteins, of which there are a variety, that are actively acting as suppressors. And the current working hypothesis about this is that they are global repressors, although obviously uh, there's evidence that their uh, reduction in MECP2 or deletion of these uh, epigenetic mechanisms will result in upregulation of some genes. But in any event, they're, they're global repressors in general. And that the disruption of MECP2 activates a variety of genes that are normally under uh, suppressed conditions. So given we found these MECP2 sites surrounding our SOX site, which we'd already known to be an important suppressor of line one, we decided to see if MECP2 would play a role in the activation of line elements in our neuroprogenitor population. So if you uh, use methylases to increase methylation, you can get a suppression of line activity using, in this case, a luciferase construct, which had the line one UTR 
uh, being driven. So it looks like methylation can have an effect on transcription. We also show that uh, MECP2 is bound to this 5' UTR region itself, and that when the cells divide, there is less binding of MECP2 to the DNA uh, of that promoter. And this also can be alleviated by 5 azocytidine. So at this point, we decided to move to the MECP2 minus mouse. So this is a mouse that was generated, deleted the active form of MECP2, so it no longer uh, acts as a, uh, a global suppressor. And there's a variety of mice out there that one can use. So we, co we expressed our luciferase construct in these cells and saw a dramatic increase in activity of the line promoter in these cells. And we think that really is MECP2 dependent because if we overexpress MECP2 in that line, we can suppress it back to the wild type level, suggesting that this really is a, a regulator. We see this is also true for ORF2. Um, and again, supporting the idea that, it, that it's involved. So to test this in vivo, what we did was to take our reporter mouse, which had the line EGFP, and, and cross these into the MSCP2 minus mouse. And obviously our prediction here is that the, the lack of line suppression would result in a greater amount of GFP positivity in the cells. And it was, it was really, it's visually quite striking. As you go through uh, various areas of the brain, <clears throat> it's a little bit bright, I don't know that you can see this, but here's cerebellum where in the past we would see individual cells. Now we see clusters of cells, lineage, a large number of cells uh, within certain areas. We've gone and mapped out in a variety of these animals to see uh, where the increase in uh, GFP occurs or where the insertions are occurring. And it's not everywhere. There are certain areas of the brain where you see a significant uh, amount of increase. In other areas, not so much. We developed some tools, uh, some quantitative tools to try to uh, get a better sense of the three-dimensional perspective on where they go. Uh, so we do serial sections uh, and uh, mount them and then reconstruct the entire brain and map out where they go. And what we find is that um, in areas like the olfactory bulb, the striatum, and the cerebellum, we get uh, two to six times as many insertions. And they are often in clusters uh, of cells. But there's a, a significant number of cells that are occurring. And it appears to be that uh, the insertions are occurring at all times when the cells are undergoing cell division. So the first cell divisions or neurogenesis that occurs are in E9 to E11. We see in those areas where, the, where neurogenesis is just first happening, we see green cells there. At E13, high clusters of uh, cells that ultimately generated the cells in the adult brain that were born here, they're green, as well as in areas where we have postnatal neurogenesis, like the olfactory bulb in the hippocampus. So this process of, of insertion uh, is occurring uh, during the early stages of neurogenesis, but both at all stages of, of this early stage of neurogenesis, both prenatally and postnatally. So, we wanted, so this was, again, all the reporter constructs. So we wanted to then uh, think about uh, seeing whether or not we could detect a difference in the DNA content of an MECP2 minus mouse versus a wild type mouse. So here, in this case, we took uh, individual cells, sorted them again, and plated them from wild type versus MECP2. We do uh, fix them in, uh, uh, synchronize their cell cycles so we are not uh, biased by that, and then amplify in 96 well plates. And so here we're using primers within ORF2. Uh, and we can reliably detect a significant increase in line DNA content within the MECP2 knockout relative to wild type. And we've done a significant number of controls uh, in the 5' prime UTR, where there's not jumping, or they're, they're truncated for the most part. We don't see differences. But also in, or to a less extent, and also uh, 
outside the line sequences, and even in fibroblasts. If we take fibroblasts and look in the ORF2 region, we don't see any change in MECP2 activity. So there's actually differences in their mobility, cell type specific manner. So given that there is an increase in MECP2, increase in line insertion MECP2 in, um, in mice, we want to take a look at this in humans as well. And some of you may be familiar with the fact that MECP2 mutation corresponds to a human uh, syndrome called Rett syndrome, which is part of the larger spectrum of autistic behaviors. It's an early developmental disorder uh, that starts off normal, but leads to uh, CNS uh, deficits, which are, as I said, uh, related to autism, but probably a distinct syndrome in and of itself. We already knew something about the morphology and the that they might hint that there were differences in these cells. So they have cells in the brain. So neurons, normal neurons, compared to uh, rats and autism cells, the autism cells generally are smaller. They're, they have fewer branches, and uh, more recently shown that they have fewer synaptic connectivity. Well, we want to take a look at this in human rat brain tissue. So we took advantage of uh, recently developed IPS technology. So we obtained uh, fibroblasts from children and some adults with Rett syndrome, fibroblasts, grew the fibroblasts up, overexpressed the four uh, transcription factors that are capable of reprogramming the fibroblasts into IPS cells. And the objective was to then make our neuroprogenitor population and differentiate those cells into neurons and determine whether or not we could detect an increase in uh, mobility at that critical point. So we've developed techniques, as I said, for doing this where we can, not only with ES cells, but also IPS cells. And in our hands, the IPS cells behave very much like uh, these, um, like normal ES cells, we can convert them and give rise to neurons. And at this point, we would take the uh, uh, cells and transfect them and measure electroporation. And very clearly, uh, in the RET cells, we get a greater number of cells that are GFP positive in these IPSC cells that are differentiated into neurons uh, repeatedly in our, in our hands. So in the final experiment, what we wanted to do was to <clears throat> look at human tissue. If they are surviving, and we, we've gone on actually to study these cells in more depth uh, once they've differentiated into neurons and are GFP positive. And we do, it, it's interesting, we see phenotypes in vitro uh, of the cells, both those that uh, show a, 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 mar a marker for GFP and, as well as cells that are non-marked for GFP. But remember, this is just a marker, and there are many other line elements that are active other than these. But these, these cells uh, recapitulate some of the phenotypes that we've seen, uh, that were seen in mouse and in pathology tissues. In other words, a decrease in cell size in synapses. But we wanted to look in the authentic tissue itself, so we were fortunate enough to get access to tissue banks which also contain tissue from heart uh, and other tissues of RETS patients that had passed away and compared those to age match, sex match controls. And then we went back to our method uh, of determining the amount of DNA that is in the uh, genome by using this quantitative multiplexing taxman methodology. And, and again, the, the theory being that not only would we see differences between heart and brain, but we would see differences in the number of the, the DNA content between, D, between the heart, the two brains. And so uh, this is the, these are the results that we saw. And the first thing is that we were able to repeat this difference in heart, uh, brain versus heart, showing greater DNA content. And in, uh, between the wild type, 
uh, and the rats, we also saw a significant difference in the number of DNA copies that we find in the genome. But no significant difference, but this is actually trending, and it's an interesting phenomenon that we are continuing to examine and looking at other tissues. Nevertheless, there is a difference between uh, these two. In all of our other controls, however, we see no difference between the others unless we use other controls like uh, ORF2 versus the Fry prime UTR. We see this same sort of statistical difference that we see from ORF2 versus satellite. So summarizing, uh, what are we thinking about? What is, what is this nutty guy talking about? So we think that under normal conditions, these lines that are taking, that exist within the genome are under normal conditions suppressed by uh, transcriptional repression, by uh, epigenetic mechanisms of suppression, and that they're not active in normal somatic cells, but only when the cells of neural origin, which have this machinery for activating line elements, uh, and just as they're undergoing cell division, they're opened up and line is transcribed. And at that time, when the chromatin is open at this stage, these cells, if they have the appropriate endonuclease site, they can insert and perhaps have some impact on the, on the cell stochastically. So the final view really is that there are a variety of times when these cells are active. It's already been suggested uh, by others that uh, at the germline cell, line can be active. <clears throat> at, at zygote activity, there could be some activity. So these would be germline changes introduced by insertions of line elements. But now we know that even at the stem cell layer, early stem cells, we have seen some small amount of insertion occurring but predominantly occurring at uh, neurogenesis periods, both in early development as well as in late stage development. So all, in addition, more and more evidence suggesting that the activity of these line elements can be in, influenced by a variety of uh, external forces during these periods of, of neurogenesis. And this is something I can't, I haven't gone into uh, in much detail. But the theory that we're working on is that this mechanism is a mechanism for generating a stochastic diversity in neurons, and that the theory being that this, adding to, this adds to the, the somatic neurological diversity uh, between individuals, and that modifications in this canonical or this, this homeostatic mechanism for generating diversity can in and of itself contribute to disease, as in the case that we would speculate in the case of, of Rett's syndrome. But at a minimum, the diversity is adding to behavioral diversity or individual differences. And the rather extreme hypothesis then would be that uh, some of the behavioral diversity that exists in a mammalian population is attributable to this somatic evolution or somatic mosaicism that is provided in the brain and that one can expand on that by increasing uh, mobility, or if one were to reduce or eliminate line mobility in these early stages, that the mean behaviors of individuals wouldn't change, but the variance or the differences between people would be uh, different. So I hope I've been a little bit provocative here, or maybe not too much, suggesting that there's evidence for line sequences forming ge a genetic mosaicism in the brain, and I think that this is actually um, a beginning of a variety of other mobile elements that we might see active. We're working actively right now on ALUs, and there's good evidence for the fact that they're also mobile in uh, somatic tissue. We're, we've learned something about the regulation, and there's an interesting parallel between the regulatory sequence, the regulatory activity of line ac lines, and the gene transcriptional machinery involved in um, making neurons in the brain. And then most provocatively, we think that this tissue-specific genetic variation challenges this concept of a st st static genome, uh, as uh, Barbara McClintock had suggested. And this has implications, we believe, for both ge genetic and uh, inherited and non-inherited disease, as this is a, a somatic event. 
So the philosophical proposition is that uh, you are unique. Uh, not only are you a product of your genes and your environment, but also a product of chance. So these are some of the people in the lab that have been brave enough to, uh, to work on this uh, topic over the last few years. Some that originally started on it and left with, in desperation. Others uh, have stuck with it, and some have even gotten jobs as a consequence of it. Uh, but we will we'll keep at it, and I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Do I take questions? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm happy to take some questions. Hi, I can ask a question over yep. here. It's a very exciting talk. Um, I'd, I'd like, before I ask my question, to get a, a point of clarification of your reporter vector with the reverse intron and GFP. Yeah. Is that driven by a heterologous promoter, or is that driven by the line promoter? Line promoter. The line promoter. So I'm, I'm wondering about... Um, being able to sequence individual integration events and their positioning in, in this neurological tissue. And you, you know, I was really struck by being able to see 80 to 300 yeah. uh, copies in the hippocampus tissue. Can you use these high throughput sequencing and okay. linker mediated PCR and pull out these so I was uh, going to actually, integration events? Yeah. Thank you. So I was gonna present some of this, the, data we've been working on for the last two years. I'll tell you a little bit about it. So we have done, as you've suggested, uh, used paired-in sequencing and using primers within the three prime end that are reasonably canonical. They, they capture about um, 30%. You can find sequences that are, that are conserved, reasonably conserved, and then chop the DNA and put adapters, sequence in both directions, and then we blasted this to quote, unquote, the genome. <laughs> the genomes, and um, we do see a significant number of new line elements, and I'm, I know that other people are doing this as well, and we're com comparing notes um, on this. Our, the analysis where we are right now is determining, it's, it's very difficult to get confirmation on insertion since it's occurring randomly in every cell, so we have to amplify the DNA first, MDA amplification, and then go back to test whether or not the hits that we find are actually found in that, uh, in that tissue. And we're in the course of, of doing that right now. Uh, but the big question is, are, and we are seeing what appear to be, what we're calling hot spots, or areas where we're finding, in the genome, we're finding multiple copies of the insertions. Uh, but we're also finding lots of sort of paired copies or individual copies there as well and trying to determine whether or not that's real or is that those single copies, is that artifactual. So these are early days. The other part I can tell you is that uh, we are seeing insertions in other tissues more than we had anticipated. So whereas all my story here was telling you it's unique to the brain, we, we clearly are seeing now in other tissues what would appear to be novel insertions. That is then making us want to go back to our data to make sure we're, we haven't got some artifact in there. So, but that's, that's, you've got it where we are right now. So are, are you taking advantage of uh, Tony Ferrano's view of which uh, three prime ends are really active for transposition? Are you seeing hopping of the active copies? Yeah, we're looking specifically for the active copies. Yeah, that's, that was the part of the, part of the uh, original source was to do that. Other people are just taking total, there's a variety of ways in which this is being approached. And it has a lot to do with the starting material that you're, which you're using. Remember that we, we're believing that this is all occurring uh, uniquely in each individual cell, that they're likely different. So our real aim is to do single cell analysis to sort out individual neurons, do MDM amplification and look at individual differences between them. I was wondering if I understood your talk correctly, the different parts. Um, would a prediction not be if the cell survived that in the case of the Rett syndrome, you would actually end up with more neurons in the, in the brain? So if, when, when neurons, why, why would you see? Because I, I thought you found a correlation with your line with the number of, uh, you, you got, I thought, more progenitors in, in, in the pictures that you showed in the mice. Was that correct or not? Sir? We saw, no, no, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. So 
We didn't see more neurons. We saw more green neurons. That means that, in fact, the brains are somewhat smaller, so we didn't even make that correction point. But there are more cells that had line activity in them, but the brain size, if anything, is slightly smaller in the rat's mouse. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. Yeah. I think he was there. Yeah. Could, could this be a mechanism for uh, a discordance in monozygotic twins in brain diseases? Yeah, well, I, you know, <clears throat> yes, I, we, would, we would speculate that. We're, do, we're doing that experiment now, looking at monozygotic twin uh, tissues. Uh, but we do, we do see this, and that was part of the reason why I showed you the monozygotic mice. So these are inbred mice uh, and taking you know, individual cells from the same region of the brain showing that the, the, the amount of insertion is different. I would, yeah, so I would, I would agree with that. And that's, that's our first attempt was using monozygotic mice. And, and, and would you expect then that even uh, uh, with all this debate on cloning, so uh, if somebody were to clone themselves, they would uh, maybe grow up with different personalities just based on this, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think we're a little early, a little <laughs> early for that. But uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, could you sort of speculate on the advantage that neurons have because of this L1 retrotransposition? Why not in heart and other cells, say in liver or whatever? And what keeps them in check in those cell types? Yeah. So we 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 address that uh, a little bit by taking. Uh, other tissues and did bisulfate sequencing around the line promoter, in the, in the line promoter on the CPG sites of uh, fibroblasts and other tissues and took many, many cells and through bisulfate sequencing it looks very much like the other tissues are more highly methylated on the promoter than in neurons. So the neurons seem to be less, significantly less uh, methylated in those regions. That's a correlation, and uh, but that that is in fact uh, one thing we did. So why would this be? Um, you know why? Why there's two parts to your question. Why would it be uniquely in the brain? What advantages? So I'll just say this: uh, as in, in neurobiology, as neurobiologists, we make in our brains we make many more cells during development than we actually need. So there's a supernumeration that occurs, both in the periphery and the CNS, and then there's a dieback that occurs of these cells. So you, you actually make more neurons than you, uh, you, more cells are proliferating. So one of the arguments that's been made about supernumeration, which is a, a separate phenomena, is that the brain then acts on that supernumeration to select for those cells that have some advantage or are, are better within the pool. And what this may tell you is that that, that doesn't tell you what, uh, what they're selecting on. What is the what's the variance on which the target may be selecting those cells that are, being, that are being generated. And this may be one of the mechanisms that provides some diversity within the pool of progenitor populations on which the local target areas then could select for uh, stochastic, or select for advantage during that developmental period. Yeah, but in that case, don't you think this uh, will not be a random process or stochastic process? In that case, if you're going to select for specific neurons in specific parts of brain, this has to be a little bit more regulated and retrotransposition may occur in specific regions in different tissues or different cell types to give that selective advantage. Otherwise, if it's a random process, then this theory of superinvention may not Okay, so I, I, it, your point, we have, we have this discussion a lot, and the, the point I think is really well taken. On the other hand, I would say, you know, evolution is not, you know, sort of targeted, you know, and this, this would be a way of get, having more of a, a, a broad range of opportunities of changes. And remember, even if it's 80 or 300, the genome is really quite large, so there's many places that they could land with having no, no activity at all. So let's take the extreme case that they are completely stochastic, which I, I don't believe that's the case because there's too yeah. much chromatin packing. But let's say it's more likely to be stochastic. That's, that would be the mechanism through which um, you'd get a broader range of diversity on which selection could occur. Alternatively, and that's why we're doing the deep sequencing, 
is there may in fact be hotspots. This may, there may be regulated, but I'm, I'm being a little agnostic about this right now because I don't know the answer, in fact. Uh, so I'm, I'm open to being able to explain it either way. <laughs> but but um, we, 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 we're anticipating, not hoping, but sort of anticipating that there might be some specificity for insertion and that would be interesting. And that's, that's what we'll find out. So we're, we're in an earlier stage. Sorry, it's, it's a little bit less uh, satisfying of an answer at this point. Yeah, I just have one question now. Last question? Or? We'll have a last question uh, and then convene uh, this in the library for uh, a reception. Yeah, I just have one question regarding the SOCS 2. And uh, you said that uh, lines are silenced due to the SOX 2 mediated uh, transcription, and there is the change in epigenetic changes associated with the uh, methylation and acetylation. And how is it, and then the neuronal differentiation is triggered, and how is it that in the SOX2 knockout, is there a change, anything like that? I mean, you see the change in the neuronal differentiation? The SOX2 knockout are lethal very, very early on. Uh, so it's a difficult, there's a hypomorph, and we haven't really looked at that, but that's, that, that, you're thinking of it in the right way. It's just that they die so early that we haven't been able to do that. If we knock out SOX2 uh, in, in vitro, then we can see the same sort of increase in, uh, in line activity. But we, we were not able to do that experiment in vivo, and we haven't looked at the hypomorph yet to see what happens. But you're thinking about it the same way we are, so thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you. We will convene in the uh, library.